Building wealth and becoming a millionaire to retire early is a common goal for basically everyone. But unfortunately, the path to getting there is always extremely vague, and there are so many videos out there that give you basic advice, like minimizing expenses or paying off credit card debt. And these are extremely important and you should be prioritizing them, but what about when it comes to investing? Today, I'm going to go through specific criteria that I think every investor should follow in order to increase the likelihood of retiring wealthy but most importantly, be able to retire from the growth and income generated from your portfolio. And unlike most videos out there, I'm going to be very specific. There are six key criteria that in my opinion should be pillars for every investor out there, and avoiding mistakes in these areas are going to increase the likelihood of retiring a millionaire. The first thing I'm going to focus on is dividends. Dividends are a very attractive aspect of investing. And when looking for an attractive dividend investment, Contrary to what most people do, in my opinion, the last thing you should be looking at is the dividend yield. This is one of the biggest mistakes that without a doubt will slow down or completely diminish the chances of retiring a millionaire. And this is because you can easily fall victim to dividend traps. What should take priority is dividend growth and yield on cost. Prioritizing these two instead is much more important, and here's why. So first, dividend growth is a representation of how much the dividend distribution of an investment increases by over time. So it's the rate of growth of dividend distributions. For example, if a stock or an ETF trades at $30 and distributes $0.30 cents per share as a dividend, this is a 1% yield. And 10 years down the road, you're hoping that turns into $1 per share. So what does this mean? This is essentially another way of representing growth. So the stock used to trade at $30 per share and is now trading at $100 per share. The most important thing to understand is that the dividend yield alone is never going to outperform capital appreciation. It is just never going to happen. But being able to combine the two and get a strong dividend yield and strong dividend growth this is a match made in heaven. And this also ties into risk mitigation, which is another investing pillar that I'll talk about in just a second. So focusing on the rate of growth of dividends is much more important than the dividend yield itself. It's also very important to find a fund that has historical dividend growth, preferably five to 10 years of consecutive growth. This, in my opinion, solidifies a strong investment. Now, there are some investments that this rule doesn't apply to, such as ETFs that use options as a way of generating dividends but I will talk about this in another video. Now, if you guys are enjoying this content and find it helpful, please do me a little favor and hit that thumbs up button for the YouTube algorithm. It really helps out my channel and I really appreciate it. So thank you guys so much. Let's move on. And an extension of dividend growth is yield on cost. And this is something that I have been preaching about for quite some time because it literally tells you everything you need to know about a fund and whether or not it is a dividend trap. It is a way of representing the NAV growth of an investment, and here's an example. To begin, think of NAV as your principal investment. And yield on cost is a representation of the dividend yield that you are receiving now relative to how much you first invested. So if I invested $10,000 in a fund right now that provides a 2.5% dividend yield, 10 years down the road, you'll still be receiving a 2.5% yield, but the dividend yield relative to your initial investment should be much higher. So for example, your initial $10,000 has grown to $20,000 and the 2.5% dividend yield you're receiving now on the $20,000 is equivalent to receiving 5% on the $10,000. So basically you want a yield on cost chart that trends in a downward direction where the right side represents your initial investment. You want the yield on your initial investment to be higher than the yield you are receiving now. And here are some great examples of downward trending yield on cost charts. This is a clear depiction of a solid dividend fund. And a trick here is that if you mirror a downward trending yield on cost chart, this represents the growth pattern of your initial investment. Now, what you wanna avoid here is a yield on cost chart that is trending upwards because this is a clear indication of NAV depletion or in other words, a dividend trap. And there are many ETFs and different stocks out there that boast a very impressive dividend yield to attract investors, but unfortunately suffer from a lot of NAV depletion. So for example, if your initial $10,000 investment has depreciated to $5,000 over the course of 10 years, the 4% yield you were getting on the $10,000 would now be 8% on $5,000. And this is a clear sign of a dividend trap. That is why you must not focus on the magical dividend yield as the first thing when you're trying to find a suitable investment. 
Focusing on maximizing dividend growth and yield on cost, in my opinion, increases the likelihood of retiring a millionaire. Now, my number one source of getting dividend growth information, yield on cost, dividend yield, and really anything that has to do with finding a strong investment is Seeking Alpha, and I highly, highly suggest to use this platform. And right now, you guys can get $50 off their premium plan by using my link in the description down below. And I'm also super excited to announce a new feature that they rolled out, which are investing groups. And these groups give you direct access to Seeking Alpha's expert analysts that create model portfolios, regular stock picks, sell and buy notifications, and provide exclusive investor resources. I myself am in two of these groups, which are the Growth Investor Pro and the Dividend Freedom Tribe. Being part of these groups has really improved my investing journey. If you guys wanna get access to these groups and check it out for yourself, there are also many other groups available, then you can get 20% off your membership by using my link in the description down below. Now back to the video. The next very common and biggest investing mistake that you should avoid is solely prioritizing maximum growth. We all know the very famous quote from Warren Buffett that states, just buy the S&P 500 every single month for the next 30 to 40 years and you will be set for life. Now, while this is the most popular investment vehicle out there, there are superior options. There are countless ETFs out there that have been able to outperform the S&P 500 and I have gone over a lot of them, such as Moat, SPGP, JQUA, etc. But the most important thing is not just an emphasis on growth potential, but also an emphasis on risk mitigation. And those ETFs have superior risk mitigating capabilities. You see, one of the most important factors of being able to retire rich is to mitigate your downside risk. And unfortunately, this isn't talked about enough, and I know that people prioritize investments that will maximize their growth as much as possible. For example, by using leverage ETFs such as TQQQ, which is a leverage ETF that provides three times the daily performance of the QQQ. And yes, these can be extremely powerful growth machines, but the risk that you're exposed to is also extremely high. So as your growth ability increases, so does your risk. Okay, now here's a quick example to show you how important it is to mitigate risk when it comes to long-term investing and retiring early as a millionaire. And this will shock you. Let's say that you're an investor that wants to prioritize growth as much as possible. And let's say that you start with a $10,000 investment and you are targeting an annual growth rate of around 20%. Now, I know this is high, but keep in mind that the NASDAQ 100 has been able to provide an average annual return of 19% since 2010. So imagine tripling that with a leverage ETF. So let's say amongst your entire investment journey, you've managed to capture 20% every year for 43 years. This is on par with Warren Buffett's track record. Your $10,000 investment would turn into $25 million by the end of 43 years. That is a fantastic number and anyone can retire on that amount of money. But now let's say that throughout your 43 year journey, on three separate occasions, so three different years, you suffered a 50% loss. And this has happened in the past, like the 2008 recession, or even the bear market of 2022, where leverage ETFs lost over 70%. So in 43 years, you only suffered a loss on three separate occasions. Now, looking at that, it seems like a phenomenal track record. But with these losses, your portfolio value would now be worth $1.8 million. That is less than 10% of what it would be if you had suffered no losses. So it doesn't matter that you prioritize maximum growth and crush the overall market 40 out of the 43 years. That is why you have to prioritize consistency and risk mitigation as opposed to maximum growth. This is why dividend investments are ideal for consistent and risk averse returns. Now, another important thing to remember is the power of compounding. For example, a $10,000 investment growing at even 7% a year and reinvesting $500 every month gives you almost $1.9 million by the end of 43 years. Achieving 12% every year without any monthly reinvestments would give you $1.69 million in 43 years. That is nearly 75% higher returns every single year and yet you still would not outperform. So you can earn 7% every year, avoid major losses and reinvest regularly and you will outperform an investor that managed to get 20% every year for 40 years but lost three times. In my opinion, achieving 7% a year in growth is much more realistic and achievable. Now, you can try to achieve 10% and still reinvest $500 every month, 
But again, the more growth you aim for, the more your risk grows as well. And just to give you guys a bit of a reference here, investing $500 a month is not a crazy number. It is the equivalent of saving $16 a day, which is also equivalent to buying two coffees from Starbucks. So you don't need to set your eyes on the highest returning asset because if it skyrocketed exponentially, then it could fall just as fast. Now, there are metrics that can help you get a better understanding of downside risk, such as the Certino ratio. This is a number that represents how much risk a fund or a stock is taking on in order to achieve its return. The higher the number, the more risk averse and smarter the investment is. And I'll go through this in more detail in another video. Now, one of the best ways to minimize risk is by diversifying your assets and using ETFs as opposed to individual stocks. If you have a large number of assets, you will not be exposed to the same level of downside risk. But of course, ETFs themselves can also carry high levels of risk depending on the type of stocks they invest in. So it's very important to get a thorough understanding of how an ETF works and the type of stocks it holds. Probably one of the most important rules of investing is to always know what you're putting your money into. And on this channel, I prioritize breaking down investments in detail so that this barrier is broken down for everyday investors. All right, the next extremely important aspect of investing is expenses. One of the biggest wealth killers is paying a high expense for an ETF. If an ETF is providing you with similar returns to the S&P 500, but is charging you 10 times as much to do so, it is simply going to slow down the process of you retiring a millionaire. For example, a $100,000 investment in an ETF with an expense ratio of 0.06%, and let's say that the investment grew by 10% every year, over the course of 40 years, your portfolio value would grow to $4.5 million and you'd pay a total of $54,000 in fees. But now, if you invest the same amount in an ETF that has a 0.6% expense ratio, using all the same criteria, after 40 years, you would pay over $540,000 in fees. So when you look at things in the long term, it truly opens your eyes as to how important it is to avoid a high expense ratio. All right, so next we have total return. Total return gives you the actual performance of an investment, including its growth and its dividend yield. You have to pay very close attention to total return, especially when you're working with ETFs that provide dividends. And I know this may sound pretty straightforward, but let me give you an example of how investors can get confused. And really this has to do with investment platforms. A very popular investment platform is TradingView, and unfortunately this platform only displays price return as opposed to total return. So let's take a very popular high income ETF like JEPI, which is the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF. And this ETF uses options to generate a very high dividend yield of around 8% and the dividend yield makes up a very large portion of the fund's total returns. So if we simply look at price return, which excludes its dividends, you're not going to get an accurate judgment. And on TradingView, you see an ETF that has only been able to appreciate by 13% over the last four years, but this is extremely inaccurate. Now, if you use platforms like Seeking Alpha, the charts display the total returns of the ETF. So when you look at Jeppy's total return now, you see a fund that has appreciated by over 60% in the last four years. In fact, they give you the option to change between total return and price return. Price return excludes the dividend yield. So please keep in mind that when you're judging an investment, you have to consider its total return and not just its price return. Next on the list, we have taxes. Now, I'm not going to go through an entire breakdown of taxes and how to minimize them, but it's important to remember that depending on the types of accounts you open, your tax liabilities change significantly. In general, a Roth IRA is a preferred account over an IRA because all of your growth and dividend income is not going to be taxed. Only the money that you initially put into the Roth IRA is taxed. An IRA can be funded with pre-tax dollars, but you will be taxed on all of your gains, which also includes dividend income. It's important to keep in mind that there are contribution limits every year, so you should prioritize maxing these out every single year. Now, choosing between a Roth IRA and a regular IRA really comes down to your tax bracket. If you feel that you're going to be in a higher tax bracket as you age because your income is going to grow, then you can prioritize a Roth IRA. But if you think that your tax bracket will likely be lower as you age, then it is better to get taxed down the road. 
So in this situation, an IRA would be better. So there you guys have it. Those are the six key criteria that I think will increase the likelihood of an investor retiring early and retiring as a millionaire. Now, please remember that this is not financial advice. This is just my personal opinion based on a lot of research. And that is all for this one. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to my channel and hit the thumbs up button for the YouTube algorithm. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in my next one.